Hey, hey, it's working. Do you guys want to see my painting? So remember that painting that I started when I was drinking the Pinot Noir? Ta-da! Hello, my name is Alessandra Smith and welcome back to Wine Reform. So today we are trying a Pinot Grigio by Smoking Loon. They've been around since 2000. They are in the Napa Valley, um, and I hope they're doing all right now since the fires are totally ravaging California and nobody deserves that. I love the back of this bottle because it says, besides his being kind of crazy, they called him the smoking loon because he was so damn efficient, Jake began stubbing out his cigar. He'd take care of business and get in and out before anybody'd see him coming leaving no trace except the lingering sound of his eerie loon-like cackle. No one was really sure who he was or who he worked for, but when word got out someone needed his services, the smoking loon just appeared on their doorstep, like out of thin air or something. Anyway, that's on the back of the bottle. Uh, I think that says uh, all you need to know about this winery. Let's talk about Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is one of those um, grapes that has been around forever. Some may know Pinot Grigio as Pinot Gris, and it literally just means pine gray. So kind of like Pinot Noir meant pine black, um, pine gray. So it describes uh, the way that the grapes are clustered on the vine, uh, looking like a pine cone, and the general color of the grapes, um, that being gray. Pinot Grigio, um, it originated in Burgundy, like many other grapes, and it started as Pinot Gris. It migrated to Switzerland in the 14th century, uh, and the royalty loved it. They could not get enough. And then it made its way to northern Italy, near the Alps, um, and it became Pinot Grigio. So it's a really popular export for northern Italy, uh, but it is all over it's 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 in a lot of places <laughs> it's all over the world pinot grigio it falls into three camps you can get dry and fruity uh dry and minerally or sweet and fruity if you're looking for dry and fruity you're gonna find that in southern italy uh new zealand chile california oregon washington and argentina if you're looking for that dry and minerally Pinot Grigio, you're gonna find that in Northern Italy, Austria, Romania, uh, Slovenia, Hungary, Canada, and parts of Germany. And if you're looking for that sweet and fruity, you're gonna find that in Alsace, France. Because we are trying a Pinot Grigio from the Napa Valley, I'm expecting that to be dry and fruity. So I went to my local liquor outlet, whew, and I spent $7.99 before tax. So like the Dark Horse, this is another $8 bottle of wine. Let's, uh, let's dig in. This is a screw top, finally. The screw top was actually something that really came out of the uh, Australian wine scene. If you don't clean things properly, your cork can rot, um, and your cork can have bacteria and ruin your wine, or it can crumble. And you know what? Australian winemakers said, screw that, we're gonna use a screw cap. And they did. And it works quite well if you have a wine which you are not gonna age for a while. So this is meant, the wine is meant to be stored standing up if you see it in anything but a natural cork. And that means that you're not gonna keep it for longer than a year, most likely. You're gonna drink it right away, you're gonna drink it young. Um, and that's what we have right here. So, we don't need this. Lazy people, you're welcome. I know I shouldn't smell out of the bottle because it kind of ruins the experience of sniffing out of the glass, but like, damn. So when we're trying wine, we only need a little bit. I always over pour, no biggie. And because it's a screw top, I can put the cap back on and I can protect the wine. Isn't that magical? When we are tasting wine, we start by looking at it. So we're gonna look at the color. Wowie zowie, would you look at that? It is almost quite literally white. Um, and you can see all the way through it. Um, it is the most pale, the most pale yellow I have seen. It looks fairly watery. 
so it looks like a light bodied wine. Very, very pale yellow color. The next thing we do is we smell the wine. Woo! Oh, uh, typically when I'm looking for uh, Pinot Grigio from the States, uh, it's gonna fall into that dry and fruity camp. So I'm gonna be looking for pale stone fruits, melons, zest, almonds, some of the terroir usually coming through in the form of like a vague minerality, the taste of like salt or licking some other kind of dry rock. So wowie, zowie, right off the bat, I got very strong notes of um, cantaloupe. It almost smells like um, like cantaloupe and it's got like the zing of like a lemon drop. So it's not quite a lemon zest, it's more like a vaguely bitter lemon candy. And I can really smell the alcohol. So it kind of smells like, um, kind of smells like the leaf of like uh, an orange tree. So it's, so it's fruity, um, but it's not quite as strong. Uh, after taking a good smell of this wine, I am getting lemon drop um, and cantaloupe and maybe a little bit, a little bit of like, like a root, uh, like the root of... I'm a little disappointed actually because when I was smelling, I, I gave it a sniff, the only two really distinct um, scents I could get out of it were the um, lemon drop and the cantaloupe. Yeah, yeah, that disappoints me just a little bit, but that's okay. Um, typically, when I am evaluating a wine, I like to try to get at least three distinct smells out of it, and that's how I can determine whether or not it's going to be a bit more complex, or maybe not. Um, and if I can't get three uh, three distinct scents, then it's probably, it's. I'm guessing it's not going to be as complex as I was hoping. Okay, now that we have established the color and the nose, we are gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give it a sip and I'll tell you what I taste. Wowee, alrighty. So, it um, it tastes like kind of a lemon zest um, and uh, white peaches. The acidity uh, was immediate, um, but it didn't linger. So I did get like a zap of like almost like like when you pucker after having something, um, maybe after having an orange that wasn't as sweet, that's the kind of acidity that I was feeling. It's not as dry as I thought it would be. It's definitely a bit, it's, it's a bit off dry. It's not quite dry. Medium acidity, uh, lemon zest, apricot, um, off dry. Okay, so uh, I'm getting very light bodied. I'm really not feeling it on my tongue. I get a medium acidity because I get an immediate zing, but it doesn't last the way that a more acidic wine would. Um, I get off dry because I feel a bit of that uh, drying sensation. I feel like it's not as sweet. Um, it's not sweet, but it's not as dry as some other dry wines I've had. In terms of the palate, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock it over. That's fine. I'm, in terms of palate, I'm getting a bit of a hint a hint of lemongrass. I'm getting that lemon zest and I'm getting a uh, white peach. In terms of acidity, it's actually fairly, it's, it's fairly medium. It's really not strong. Um, in terms of the body, very light. When it's on my tongue, it doesn't feel heavy at all. It almost feels like water. Let me tell you the finish. I got a very medium finish out of this. Okay, so to recap, I got um, very, very uh, pale, pale yellow uh, wine, great clarity. The nose was lemon drop and cantaloupe. The alcohol, I could smell it. So this one is 12.5% alcohol by volume, so not the highest. To recap, very, very pale yellow color. Lemon drop and cantaloupe nose. Sort of flavor of white peach, lemon zest, and a little bit of lemon grass. Um, in terms of acidity, medium acidity. Uh, in terms of body, so light-bodied it felt like water. Very uh, that in that sense, it was very refreshing, and the alcohol content is pretty low as it is 12.5%. This one, this wine, it was well, it is good. It was not terribly complex. I think that in the future, if I was to get this wine again, I think it would work really well for a white sangria. Any sort of very um, light fare that you don't want. Uh, you don't want your drink overpowering. So if you're gonna have maybe uh, salads, if you're gonna have a very light grilled chicken, 
things that aren't seasoned very strongly um, and things that have fresher or crisper flavors, I think that this would complement them well. But yes, it is not the most complex wine I've ever had, but it is a good wine. Would I recommend it to someone again? Um, unfortunately, I don't think I would uh, if they were just gonna drink it straight. However, if they were looking for a beautiful bottle and they wanted something that they could make a white sangria with, I, I would recommend using this in a sort of wine cocktail like that. I think it would work for that. Uh, in terms of what I would pair this with, um, depending on my mood, I think I would definitely pair it with a sort of afternoon snack. So if I was gonna have oranges or any um, fruit platter, I think that this would be very tasty. I'm really getting 1920s vibes from this and I kind of just have to go with it. So <laughs> last week I will have put out a um, part one of home wine making uh, because the best way, uh, I think the best way to really get to know wine um, is to experience it firsthand. Be there with it, like treat it like your child. Treat wine like your child and you will get to know it. So that's why I'm making wine. Thank you again for joining me and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys all next week. Bye. That is dangerous. You know you could drink a whole darn bottle of this thing and not even notice until you're done? Ooh, I'm gonna knock it over.